Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Arkanasa Radio Studios in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about mystery ships. I did a show on haunted ships a few weeks ago. Ships with ghosts hanging around and causing people some concern and making life interesting. So... Tonight I'm going to talk about some ships that have been involved in mysteries that just don't make any sense. Strange things on the high seas. In 1862, a f story of an unfortunate schooner named Jenny appeared in the German geographical magazine Globus. The author of the story was anonymous and the details seem incredible. The story recounts the finding of the whaler, Hope, in 1840. In September 1860, the crew of the whaler, Hope, uh, spotted a battered ship emerging from the gap between two icebergs in Drake Passage. A Drake Passage is the body of water between South America and Cape Horn and the South Shetland Islands of Antarctica. It connects the southwest part of the Atlantic Ocean with the southeast part of the Pacific Ocean and extends into the Southern Ocean. As the Hope sailed closer to the unknown ship, the crew saw what looked like seven men standing at attention on the main deck. As the Hope closed, they realized the men appeared frozen solid, as if caught out in some storm and flash frozen. All the bodies appeared to be in good condition and recently frozen. I'm sorry it was at 1840, not 1860. The men of the Hope could now see the name of the mystery ship painted on the bow. The battered schooner was the Jenny out of the Isle of Wright. And Captain Brighton of the Hope boarded the Jenny to investigate further. Below decks, he came across a man writing in the ship's log. Now, thinking the man hadn't heard him coming down the ladder, Captain Brighton greeted him. The man did not respond to the greeting, or it appeared to be moving at all. The captain realized the man was frozen solid, just like his crew. Looking at the log, he noted the last entry was May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. The date indicated that the last entry had been made 37 years ago. The man sitting at the desk had been dead, sitting in his chair, waiting for someone to come along and find him. The Jenny had sailed out of its home port in 1822 en route to Caleo, Peru, with a hold filled with cargo. They had put into port in Peru and then began their return trip for England. The ship was to sail south through the Drake Passage and then turn north. They encountered a storm and wound up becoming trapped in the ice off the coast of the Antarctica. They had missed the Drake Passage and wound up in the South Ocean. Slowly, everyone on board the Jenny starved to death or died from the cold, including the captain's wife, who was found dead in the captain's cabin, along with the family dog. And captain Brighton took the logbook to return it to the ship's owners, and he continued his search. The Hope sailed off, leaving the ill-fated crew of the Jenny frozen where they had died 37 years ago. 
and later ships passing through the area never encountered the Jenny. It either was sunk by the icebergs that were floating around it, or it was trapped once more in the pack ice along the coast of Antarctica. In 1882, William and Sons laid down the keel that would become the iron-hulled passenger steamer that would be christened the SS Valencia. As she was built as a passenger ship to transport people between California and Alaska. In 1906, the SS Pueblo was laid up in Seattle. The Pueblo was the sister ship of the Valencia, and they were owned by the same company. With the Pueblo out of service, the Valencia took over the route running from San Francisco to Seattle, leaving port on January 20th with 108 passengers and 65 crew. In the early morning hours of the next day, a storm was brewing just off the coast of Mendocino. The captain and crew were not familiar with the coast along the route they were taking, and the ship ran into some jagged rocks. The rocks tore a massive hole in the hull of the Valencia, and the ship began taking on water. The crew began damage control measures, but the opening was far greater than they were able to handle. The captain decided the best course of action was to run the ship into the shore, hoping to beach and save the ship and its passengers and crew. The passengers had been asleep in their cabins and came running onto the deck in their nightgowns. It was the middle of January, and the freezing rain soaked everyone's skin in seconds. The Valencia was within 50 feet of the shore when its progress came to a halt. Instead of running up on a beach, the ship was now trapped on the rocks. The storm-driven waves were slamming into the ship, and it was rocking precariously to and fro, grinding the hull open in several places. The captain tried to coax the Valencia off the rocks and closer to the shore. He wanted to at least get off the rocks before trying to abandon ship because the rocking motion would have made lowering the lifeboats just too dangerous. Waves were crashing over the rail, washing people overboard. The people had to grab hold of anything they could in an effort to stay on deck. Some of the passengers clomb up into the rigging and tied themselves in place to keep from being thrown overboard as the ship rocked back and forth. Families tried to stay together, but the wind, rain, and waves added to the confusion. The crew and passengers were in a panic, and they began to lower the lifeboats without orders from the captain. With the waves hitting the ship and the rocks grinding away at the steel hull, the ship was tossed back and forth. The first lifeboat slipped its mooring and landed in the water below without anyone in it. The boat was tossed around like a toy and vanished into the night. A six of the next seven lifeboats flipped over, dumping their people into the waves. The people were left to fend for themselves in water too violent to swim. One lifeboat managed to stay upright, and the crew began rowing as hard as they could to reach the shore. The people in the water screamed and cried, trying to get the escaping lifeboat to come back and rescue them. Men and women were left in the rigging. Men and women were left in the raging surf. The lifeboat was at its capacity, and any more people would have capsized it as well. The lifeboat that did manage to stay afloat found a rocky coast with no beach to land on. As the twelve men on board tried to get to shore, three of them were swept away by violent waves. The nine surviving men found themselves at the bottom of some cliffs, and they had to climb in the driving rain and wind. Against the odds, the nine men did make it to the top of the cliff and staggered towards the lights of town in an attempt to sound the alarm and get help. 
They stumbled along through the storm until they spotted a telegraph line. They followed the lines to the office. Later, they were criticized for not attempting to set up rescue lines with a grounded ship. In the storm and rain, the wind, in the dark, with no ropes to set. Back on board the Valencia, the boatswain, he's the ship's officer in charge of equipment and the crew, managed to round up enough crewmen to lower the last remaining lifeboat. With an experienced man in charge, the boat made it into the waves and the crew tried to row to the shore to set up rescue lines. The lines could not be set in the raging storm, so instead the men set off for the lighthouse to sound the alarm. The lighthouse keeper phoned the town only to find news that had already been passed by the group of nine men that had followed the telegraph line. Three ships set out in the dark once the storm had become less violent. By morning they managed to find the Valencia. The wind and waves were still too much to set lines to the stranded ship. They were forced to stand by and wait for the storm to abate. A rescue party had left town walking through the rain to reach the cliffs overlooking the wreck. They set up lines down to the water to raise anyone up the cliff face. There were still two lifeboats on the Valencia, but no one was willing to try lowering them, as seeing as one, only one lifeboat had made it to shore. Instead, the folks still on the stranded ship thought it was a better idea to wait for the ships nearby to do all the rescuing. The men on the cliff could see passengers still in the rigging, but no one was trying to escape. The wind was still blowing, making communications impossible. The men on the cliff watched as a wave slammed into the Valencia, and it broke free from the rocks. Instead of floating to shore, it was pushed farther from the coast. No longer being supported by the rocks, the Valencia sank with a few remaining passengers still on board. The SS city of Topeka began searching for survivors. They found one lifeboat with 18 men on board. The second life raft eventually drifted to shore near Barclay Sound with four survivors. The death toll was 187. The 37 survivors were all men. None of the women or children made it off of the Valencia. Five months after the sinking of the Valencia, a fisherman said he found a life raft with eight skeletons on it nearby cave. A salvage party went out to retrieve the raft, but no one was ever able to locate it. 1910, it was reported in the Seattle Times the SS Valencia was spotted off the Pachina Point. People spotted the ships sailing along the coast. Sailors still claim today that they can see the specter of the steamer drifting near the reef in Pachina Point. 1933, 27 years after the Valencia went down, lifeboat number five was found floating peacefully off Barclay Sound. It was in good condition with much of the original paint remaining. There was no sign of survivors on board. A lifeboat number five was the first boat launched that had slipped its mooring and was washed away. How could a lifeboat float around in a well-traveled area, uh, well-traveled sea lane for 27 years without anyone seeing it? How was it able to stay afloat for so long? It makes you wonder about things going on out there in the oceans. The Kabenhaven, or Copenhagen, was built for the Danish East Asiatic Company in 1921. 
When it was launched, it was the world's largest sailing ship. The main mast stood over five stories high. From 1921 to 1928, the, ma the ship made nine voyages, visiting nearly every continent and completing two circumnavigations of the planet. On September 21, 1928, the Copenhagen departed from Norsundby in northern Jutland for Buenos Aires on its 10th voyage. The captain, Hans Andersen, a very well-seasoned sailor, there were 75 people on board, which included 26 crew of 45 cadets. The goal was to unload the shipload of chalk and bagged cement in Buenos Aires, and take on another load of cargo and sail for Melbourne, and then bring a shipment of Australian wheat back to Europe. The ship and crew arrived in Buenos Aires on November 17, 1928. The cargo was unloaded quickly. The ship's departure was delayed as there were no paying cargoes heading to Australia. It cost money to run these big ships and so the captain didn't want to set sail empty. The trucking industry they call this deadheading. It's when you're burning up fuel and you're traveling but you're not making any money. December 14th, almost a month after arriving in Buenos Aires, Captain Anderson decided it was time to set for sail for Australia, even without a cargo. The voyage was expected to take 45 days. December 22nd, the Copenhagen exchanged radio messages with the Norwegian steamer William Bloomer, indicating they were about 900 miles from Tristan da Cahuna, Canuna, Cunha, uh, Tristan de Cunha, and that all was well on board ship. Cunha. That's one of those little islands down south. Cahuna. That's a guy that s rides a surfboard. The big Cahuna. Anyway, later that night, the Bloomer attempted to contact the Copenhagen again, but the Danish ship didn't answer. Due to the distance and the length of the voyage, the Australian to Australia, the Danish were not initially worried about the silence from the ship. The Captain Anderson was known for going long periods of time without sending out any radio messages. As months went by without any word, the folks back home became concerned. In April 1929, the Danish East Asiatic Company dispatched a motor vessel, the Mexico, to Tristan de Cunha to search for the Copenhagen. They received reports that a large five-masted ship with its foremast broken had been seen in January 21, 1929. However, it had made no attempt to come ashore, or had it send out any distress signal. The Mexico, joined by the British Royal Navy, searched for the Copenhagen for several months, but they never found sign of the missing ship or any indication that the crew had been in trouble. When no sign of the ship or any of the crew were found, the Danish government declared the ship and its crew were lost at sea. For the next few years after the Copenhagen disappearance, there were a number of sightings of mysterious five-masted ships fitting its description. This mystery ship was seen adrift in the Pacific Ocean between South America and Australia. In July 1930, the crew of an Argentine freighter sighted a five-masted phantom ship during a gale. The captain took their statements and wondered if this was the Wrath of the Copenhagen. Ah, not Wrath, Wraith. Wraith is a cane of ghost. The further sightings came in the following weeks and months from Easter Island and across the Peruvian coast. The Copenhagen 
has a very distinct silhouette. It has four tall masts standing 50 feet and then a slightly shorter mast at the stern. Once steam power had become the norm, any kind of a tall masted ship would stand out as you're sailing around the Pacific. What happened to the Copenhagen and her crew is still a mystery today. Once again, it's another one of those Norwegian, Danish names that's going to be hard to pronounce, but I'll give it a try. The SS Angermann Halven was a 230 foot long, 1,322 steel, ton steel hulled cargo steamer built in Lindholmen's shipyard in Gothenburg, Sweden. Part of my family came from Sweden. Not a single one of us speaks Swedish. 1914. Her job was transporting goods between Sweden and Hamburg. During World War I, Sweden attempted to remain neutral and to assert its right to trade with the belligerent countries. For Great Britain, the blockade was an important weapon and Sweden's demand to import freely only favored Germany. As a result, the Allies stopped a large percentage of Swedish trade. This not only affected Sweden's exports to Germany, but from 1916 it caused a severe shortage of food in Sweden. At the end of World War I, as part of Germany's war reparations, the ship was handed over to the British. 1921, the ship was acquired by the Hudson Bay Company in Androsen, Scotland, where she was renamed as Bay Chimo. Legend says that when every ship is christened, its name goes into a ledger of the deep, maintained by Neptune or Poseidon. Renaming a ship or a boat means you're trying to slip something past the gods and you will be punished for your deviousness. The Bay Chimo's new mission was collecting fur pelts and trading them for sugar, tea, tobacco, and weapons along the Canadian coast during the summer seasons. For the next 10 years, the SS Bay Chimo circumnavigated the globe, carrying supplies between Scotland and Canada. October 1, 1931, while en route to Vancouver, the SS Bay Chimo became trapped in the early season ice pack near Barrow, Alaska. The ship was at the end of a trade run and the crew needed supplies, so they hiked across the ice for a half a mile to the Alaskan town. Once they had obtained what they needed, the crew hiked back to their ship. A week later, the SS Bay Chimo got trapped in the ice once again. This time, it was a bit more serious. The Hudson Bay Company arranged for 22 of its employees to be removed from the ship and transported back home. The captain and 14 sailors were left behind to keep an eye on the ship and maintain it through the winter. If a small break in the hull happened, the crew could easily fix it and save the ship. Had there been nobody around, the ship would be at the mercies of the weather. The men moved one of the lifeboats to the shore and built a wooden shelter to use during the winter. They would move back and forth to the ship each day to inspect it and then back to shore for the night. November 24th, the temperature rose from a minus 60 to zero, and for three days a blizzard raged, preventing the crew from leaving their wooden shelter. When they were finally able to get out, Bechimo was no longer trapped in the ice. In fact, she wasn't anywhere around. The ship was gone. The crew assumed that their ship had sunk during the storm. A few days later, an Inuit seal hunter told the crew that he'd seen their ship floating some 45 miles away. 
The crew hoisted the mast and sail on their lifeboat, and they sailed after their ship, managing to track her down. Due to having been at sea, in ice, without anybody to maintain her, the Machimo was in such bad shape that the captain decided it was best to simply unload the cargo and anything of value. The Machimo was no longer seaworthy and was to be consigned to the depths. The abandoned ship remained afloat in the Arctic water. It was now sailing alone without a crew. This went on for decades. Even with no power from the engines, the ship managed to move about the frigid waters. Her life as a ghost ship began over the next 40 years. She was sighted 12 times that we know of. The first sighting was several months and 250 miles to the east of where she had been abandoned. 1932, a trading party boarded the Bachimo near Wainwright, Alaska. Not finding anything of value, the traders left the ship to the elements. 1933, Inuit villagers used the ship for shelter during a storm that lasted for 10 days. Not having any use for a huge ship, the villagers left once it was safe and never thought about trying to salvage the ship. 1939, Captain Hugh Polson made an unsuccessful attempt to salvage her from the ice. Once more, the ship was trapped in the ice and it was impractical to try waiting out the weather. The last recorded sighting of the Bay Chimo was in 1969 when a sailing party encountered her between Point Barrow and Icy Cape in the Chukchai Sea. Nobody has seen the ship since, and while some presume she sank or was destroyed in a storm, no wreckage has ever been found. I imagine that captain felt kind of sheepish when he found out that the ship had sailed long after his career had come to an end. Not because of anything bad, but simply old age. The triple-masted schooner named Lady Lovabond, which is sometimes called the Lady Lovibond, was being prepared to set sail the day before St. Valentine's Day, which perhaps ominously fell on a Saturday that year. A sailors consider it bad luck to begin a voyage on a Friday because this was the day Jesus was executed. You have to leave port on a Thursday before midnight or Saturday morning right after midnight. A Captain Simon Reed planned a voyage along the River Thames uh, towards the open sea and circumnavigate the Kent coast before heading out towards the sunnier climate found off the coast of Portugal. Reed organized this entire trip as a honeymoon for his new bride, Anita. As the lovey bond pulled away from the pier Friday evening, the initial voyage was very much a party atmosphere with celebrations taking place all about the decks. The whole crew of the ship was pleased for the happy couple a first mate John Rivers had been the best man. He was the only member of the crew not happy about the whole occasion. He had wanted Anita as his bride and was somewhat angry at her being wed to his captain. Even though his infatuation of the bride was likely a secret one, he concocted a plan to get some measure of revenge. She should have known he was in love with him, even though he had never said or did anything. Whether or not his intentions were realized fully will probably never be known. Six miles off the Dell coast, not far from the Straits of Dover, is a geological feature known as the Goodwin Sands. This anomaly is approximately 10 miles long, and lies between 32 and 42 feet below the surface of the English Channel 
and has a reputation for having wrecked around 2,000 vehicles over the years. As the Lady Lavi Bond made its approach to Goodwin Sands, Rivers made his move. Alcohol helped fuel his feelings of rage and envy and compelled him to sneak up behind the acting bosun and deliver a hard blow to the back of the man's head. With the ship in his control, Rivers deliberately ran the Lady Lavi Bond aground on the shifting sands at Goodwin. The story of the Lady Lavi Bond does not end with it crashing into the sandbar. Five decades later to the day, the skipper of another vessel, the Edinburgh, was a man named James Westlake. In his log, he recorded how his ship almost collided with another vessel with three masts. This vessel, described as a schooner, came so close to the Edinburgh that sounds of a celebration could be heard. The Edinburgh was not the only vessel to encounter a near miss. A fishing boat also reported a sighting of the same thing, but with additional details. The trawler's captain said that he watched as the ship continued onward, almost unconcerned until it was on top of the sandbar, and broke up shortly after. The captain sounded the alarm and the crew launched their lifeboats to attempt a rescue. The rescue efforts were called off when not so much as a piece of wood was found in the vicinity of where the wreck should have been. February 13th, 50 years after this sighting, there was another. Local residents saw a ship with three masts on its way to a collision with the Goodwin Sands. Like the Edinburgh incident, no wreckage was found, nor any evidence that a collision had actually taken place. Similar reports were made in 1898 and an identical incident. The last report to be filed was made in 1948 by Captain Bull Prestwick. He reported he sighted the Lady Lavi Bond and considered her to be a real vessel and not a ghost ship. This was despite his admission that the vessel was giving off a strange, eerie green glow. No known report was made in 1998, but the vast number of people having heard the history of the sightings turned up in the expectation of seeing the vessel for themselves. All these potential witnesses ended up disappointed as the Lady Lavi Bond herself was a no-show. I don't find this all that unusual. When dozens of people are all in the same place focused on seeing some unexplained phenomena, it is usually not there. With the exception of ghost lights that seem to show up no matter what the crowd is there for, Things like ghosts seem to be driven away by massive expectations. Right up there with Bigfoot and trail cams. Time to take a little break here and play a couple of commercials and drink some coffee. Don't go away, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. a bump in the night and you think it just might be a ghost contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society at Laredo Paranormal at hotmail.com that's the LPRS for all your otherworldly needs If you need to squint and hold things out at arm's length to see them, maybe you should get your eyes checked. Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, is right across from the Embassy Suites. 
and stop squinting and start seeing. Coffee, nectar of the gods. And at the Organic Man Coffee Trike, you'll find coffee made the right way. One delicious cup at a time. Stop on by 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. And remember, life is too short to drink bad coffee. Are you taking care of your skin? Or are you going to wait and see how time treats you? Take care today by contacting Lourdes James, Independent Beauty Consultant at 956-723-3019. Don't let time get the best of you. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back to the show. In 1920, the Carol A. Deering set sail from Norfolk, Virginia, in tip-top shape with an experienced captain and crew of 10 men bound for Rio de Janeiro, carrying a cargo of coal. <clears throat> the ship departed on August 22nd, and although Captain William H. Merrill fell ill a few days later and had to be replaced by a hastily recruited Captain Warmel, the ship delivered its cargo on schedule and set sail to return in December. A light ship caper named Captain Jacobson aboard the Cape Lookout Lightship in North Carolina sighted the vessel bound for its home port in January 29, 1921. The Carol Deering hailed the light ship, and an unidentified crewman reported that the ship had lost its anchors. The Captain Jacobson took note of this, but was unable to report it due to his radio being out. He would later describe the crew of the Carol Deering milling around suspiciously on the foredeck of the ship. Uh, two days later, on the morning of January 31st, a Chief Petty Officer Brady of the Cape Hatteras Coast Guard Station spotted the schooner aground and helpless on Diamond Shoals. Its sails still set and its lifeboats were missing. Rough water kept surf boats from reaching the wreck until February 4th when C.P. Brady initially suspicions proved correct. The Carol Deering was abandoned. The crew had vanished like ghosts. Gone with them were personal belongings, key navigational equipment, and some papers. They also discovered both of the ship's anchors were indeed missing. Despite an, ex an exhaustive investigation by the FBI, no trace of the crew or the ship's logs have ever been uncovered. To this day, the Carol A. Deering is one of most discussed and written about maritime mysteries of the 20th century. Its enduring popularity no doubt fueled by a complete uncertainty as to how the ship arrived at its fate. Often called the ghost ship of the Outer Banks, the Carol Deering remains an unsolved mystery. Accounts of the crew allegedly dissatisfaction with the new captain, Warmel, have led to speculation that the mutiny may have occurred while the FBI's investigation turned up leads ranging from Bolshevik sympathizers, pirates, to rum-running gangsters, all of which turned out to be dead ends. Some people have even suggested that the notorious Bermuda Triangle was to blame. The wreck of the Carol A. Deering was dynamited and scuttled in March 1921 to keep it from becoming a navigational hazard. In June 1947, a distress signal was set out from the Dutch freighter SS Orang Medin that said, All officers, including the captain, are dead. Lying in the chart room and bridge. 
possibly whole crew dead. The message was followed by a last message, I die. The American Silver Star was the first to reach the SS Orang Medan. They attempted to get the attention of the crew by hailing them verbally. It is a bad idea to just row up to a ship and climb the ladder. La later, ladder. You might be mistaken for a pirate and wind up with a load of buckshot in your pants. The hail was met with only silence. The Silver Star decided to send a rescue team to board the ship and they were met with a nightmare scene. The entire crew, including the captain, were dead. Even the ship's dog was found void of life. The Silver Star decided the SS Orang Medan was going to be towed into port. But it didn't make it because a while into the journey, smoke was seen rising from the towed ship. The Silver Star was forced to cut the tow lines and barely made it to safety before the SS Orang Medan exploded. No one knows what really happened to the crew of the SS Orang Medan, but theories include carbon monoxide poisoning, pirates, and even aliens have been floated. What could have killed the entire crew and why? None of the cargo was missing as far as could be determined, and nobody knows what caused the ship to suddenly explode. The MV Hoita was a merchant vessel from which 25 passengers and crew mysteriously disappeared in the South Pacific in 1955. To this day, no evidence of the whereabouts of the missing people has surfaced. The boat was found adrift in the South Pacific without its crew. The ship was also in very poor condition, including corroded pipes, in a radio which, while functional, only had a range of about two miles due to faulty wiring. Despite this, the extreme buoyancy of the ship made its sinking nearly impossible. Investigators, however, were puzzled as to why the crew did not remain on board or wait for help. About 5 a.m. October 3, 1955, the Hoida left Samoa Apia Harbor, bound for Takalua Island, which is about 270 miles away. The boat had been scheduled to leave on the noon tide the previous day, but her departure was delayed because her port engine clutch failed. The Hoida eventually left Samoa on one engine. As she was carrying 16 crew members and 9 passengers, including one government official, a doctor, a copra buyer, and two children. The ship's cargo consisted of medical supplies, timber, 80 empty 45-gallon oil drums, and various kinds of food. The voyage was expected to take between 41 and 48 hours. She was scheduled to return with a cargo of copra. A copra is a dried coconut kernel from which oil is obtained. The Hoida was scheduled to arrive in Tokalu Island on October 5th. On October 6th, a message from Fakaofa Port reported that the ship was overdue. No ship or land-based operator reported receiving a distress signal from the crew. A search and rescue mission was launched and ran from October 6th to the 12th. As several Sunderland flying boats from the Royal New Zealand Air Force covered an area of nearly 100,000 square miles of ocean during the search. No sign of the Hoida nor any of her passengers or crew was found. Five weeks later, November 10th, Gerald Douglas, captain of the merchant ship Tuvula, en route from Suva to Funafuti, that's the name, Funafuti, sighted the Hoida more than 600 miles west from her scheduled route, drifting north of Vanua Levu. 
the ship was partially submerged and listing heavily. Her port deck rail was awash, and there was no trace of any of the passengers or crew. The four tons of cargo were also missing. The party that boarded the ship noted that the radio was discovered tuned to 2187 hertz, the International Marine Radiophone Distress Channel. The electric clocks on board had mysteriously stopped at 1025. The ship's logbook, sextant, mechanical chronometer, and other navigational equipment, as well as the firearms Miller kept in the boat, were all missing. A doctor's bag was found on deck, containing a stethoscope, a scalpel, and four lengths of blood-stained bandages. There was still fuel in the Hoyita's tanks. From the amount used, it was calculated she made some 243 miles before her engine stopped, probably just 50 miles of Tukalu. Although the Hoida was found with her bilges and lower decks flooded, her hull was sound. Given the fact that the hull of the Hoida was sound and her design made her unsinkable, a main concern of investigators was determining why the passengers and crew did not stay on board if the events were simply triggered by a small flooding in the engine room. There's no indication as to what happened to the crew or the cargo. No one has ever found remains on any beaches that could have been from the Hoida, and no one has ever come suddenly into large amounts of copra for sale. The vessel was known as the Biwa Discoverer when it was first sold to the Danish company Biwa Cruises in 1974. Two years later, it was sold again, this time July 1976, to Adventure Cruises, Inc., and registered in Singapore. While at Adventure Cruises, it was renamed the World Discoverer. During this time, the ship served a long-term charter with Society Expeditions. 1990, she was registered in Liberia. Six years later, she was refurbished to look like new. During inclement weather in April 2000, the ship struck a reef just off the Solomon Islands in Pacific Ocean. The captain radioed for assistance, and before long, all passengers were shuttled off the World Discoverer by local ferries. The captain, captain Oliver Krauss, managed to nurse the ship into nearby Roderick Bay, where she began to list until settling into her final resting place. It would be relatively routine task to patch up the damage and refloat the ship. Before the ship repair crew could get to the Discoverer, a civil war broke out in the Solomon Islands. George Spiat and a group of gunmen took the Fijian government hostage in Suva's parliament building. An armed group in the Solomon Islands, known as the Malatian Eagle Force, or MEF, seized the country's prime minister, Bartholomew Ulafalu, and placed him under protective care. MEF spokesman Andrew Norrie, a lawyer, former MP and minister, denied that the group was engaged in a coup preferring to say the Prime Minister was under supervised detention in order to force him to resign. The rival IFM militia responded by occupying the Golden Ridge Gold Mine, owned by the Australian company Delta Gold, and seizing mine vehicles, equipment, and weapons. Heavy fighting between the, groups, the two groups erupted. Meanwhile, the World Discoverer set off the coast waiting for repairs. When at long last the repair crew was able to get to the ship, they found that the locals had raided and stripped everything of value. The hull was just about all that remained. Refloating the ship would have been just the beginning of expensive work to put the ship back to sea. 
it was decided to just leave the Discoverer where it sits today, slowly rusting into nothing. If you want, you can search for images of the World Discoverer, if you like looking at lost causes. The High Aim 6 left the port of Lichui in southern Taiwan, October 31, 2002, and was then found without its crew drifting in Australian waters on January 8, 2003. The owner of the ship, Sai Hung Shurer, spoke last with the captain in December 2002. The, re the vessel was registered in Taiwan and flew under an Indonesian flag. This is common practice with ships. They'll be built one place, registered in another, and fly somebody else's flag. It gets a little confusing. When the ship was first sighted five days before being boarded, its motor was running and it was underway. At the time of boarding, the engine was dead and the rudder was locked. The vessel was found drifting in calm waters approximately 80 nautical miles east of Rowley Shoals inside the Australian Exclusive Economic Zone. There was no evident reason for the crew to have abandoned the ship. There was no sign of distress found, and the crew's personal effects remained on board as if they would be right back at any minute. The High Aim 6 had plenty of fuel and provisions, and no sign of a struggle could be found. Initial concerns that the ship had been carrying illegal immigrants were dismissed when the contents of the hold proved to be rotting fish. The ship was equipped for long-line fishing. The High Aim 6 was, to 6 was towed to Broome, where subsequent forensic examination was conducted. Despite a search of some 7,300 nautical miles, no trace of the crew has ever been found. Officials from the Australian customs vessel ACV Storm Bay boarded an abandoned tanker in the Gulf of Carpinteria about 100 miles southwest of Waipa. There was no one on board the vessel, which is estimated to be 260 feet in length, and it was trailing a broken tow rope from its bow. The boarding party was able to find the name Jian Seng, but there was no port of registry and the nationality was unknown. There's no indication there had been anyone on board recently, and there was no evidence the vessel had been used in any smuggling activity. There's no indication the crew left the vessel under anything other than their own will. <clears throat> A large quantity of rice was found on board, and customs officers believed the vessel may have been used to resupply fishing boats with food and fuel in the waters outside Australia's exclusive economic zone. The vessel had been disabled for some time. Based on a search of the ginseng, the customs boarding team believed the vessel was under tow when it broke free and was abandoned before drifting into Australian waters. While customs had no further interest in the vessel, it was considered a navigational hazard. When nobody contacted the Australian authorities claiming the ship, explosives were placed in the hold and the ship was sent to the bottom, becoming a home for fish living in the area. The Bell Amica is a ghost ship discovered off the coast of the Mediterranean island of Sardinia near Puente Volpe on August 24, 2006. The Italian Coast Guard discovered the ship with no crew on board. The Coast Guard boarded the vessel and steered her away from the rocks and shallow waters she was drifting towards. Once aboard, they discovered a half-eaten meal of Egyptian food, the French maps of North Africa, a pile of clothes, and a flag from Luxembourg. The ship had been described as a classic-style schooner, which had not been seen in Italy before. 
The investigation found that she had never been registered in Italy nor any other country. The only identification aboard the ship was a wooden tablet or plaque that read Bell Amica which, with one L, which was a misspelling of beautiful friend. The phrase should have been Bell Amica with two L's in order to read properly in Italian. Shortly after the original report, Italian newspapers reported the owner of the ship had been found. Frank Royou from Luxembourg was identified as the owner of the vessel. The boat had been left anchored in deep water for somewhat nebulous reasons. Royou stated that he had expected to return to the yacht after returning home to address an emergency. The Italian press suggested this may have been an attempt to avoid steep taxation of a luxury vessel. Many reports at the time identified Bell Amica as a schooner. This term is frequently ex associated with sailing ships from the pre-steam era. However, it is simply a technical name for the layout of the sails. The schooners of many sizes are in current production. The misidentification of this modern yacht as an antique ship depend, deepened the mystery and probably contributed to the brief international interest at the time. The mummified body of a German sailor was found by fishermen on a yacht floating off of the Philippines. Police were investigating after two men made the discovery. Officers determined from identify, identification documents found on the boat that the dead man was Manfred Fritz Borhrat, age 59. Inspector Mark Novellis, deputy police chief of nearby Barabo Town, said that while the cause of Fritz's death was unclear, there were no signs of foul play. Fritz's body was found seated at a desk in the radio room, slumped over his right arm like he was asleep. Fritz had reportedly been sailing the world on his yacht, Soyo, for the past 20 years. Reports said he'd been sighted, he had not been sighted, since 2009. But a friend of his did tell media that he had heard from the Mariner in 2015 by a Facebook post. Authorities were attempting to contact his friends and families in Germany in the hope they would be able to shed light on his, his movements. The police investigation found no obvious signs of violence but could not determine the cause of death. Navalis said items inside the yacht were scattered and Fritz's wallet was not found but the yacht's radio, GPS, and other valuable items were still there. A Dr. Mark Benick, a forensic criminologist in German city of Cologne, told the Bild newspaper, The way he is sitting seems to indicate that death was unexpected, perhaps from a heart attack. Reports suggest that the dry ocean winds, hot temperatures, and the salt air helped preserve his body. The photos of Fritz look as if he'd sat down at his desk to make a radio call. He'd picked up the mic and then died. When he died and where has been some time ago and nobody knows for sure where or when or how the body got into such an odd state. I have no wish nor desire to sail the high seas or leave the relative safety of shore. The things are dangerous enough on land without adding deep water and giant man-eating creatures to the mix. So I'll make all my adventures at home, either in the form of a book or the TV. Till next time, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree? With a strong upper man, the same murder three.
Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree